Welcome back into the Original Gangsters podcast. We are coming to you on a Zoom edition, uh, straight into your living rooms from our living rooms and kitchens and uh, studies and whatnot. Uh, I am your host, Scott Bernstein, along with my incomparable co-host, co-conspirator, partner in crime, the doctor, Jimmy Bucciolato. Hi, everyone. Uh, ben, behind the glass, uh, on the wheels of steel, our uh, extraordinary producer. And uh, today we are going to have a very special guest, a uh, former member, former highly decorated member of uh, federal law enforcement turned prolific author, uh, true crime aficionado. Uh, you know, he, he's, he's going to be our Sherpa uh, through a, a crazy journey of, of organized crime, bikers, drug cartels, uh, you know, through his career. Uh, his name is Ignacio uh, Esteban. He worked you, uh, for the ATF in Miami, uh, out of Tampa. He was also uh, customs uh, out of the Miami uh, airport. Right. Uh, just, you, you lived a movie script. Uh, <laughs> I, I see that a lot of our guests and, and uh, we want to talk about it. But uh, before I turn it over to you and uh, you kind of introduce yourself to the audience, I want to let everyone know that uh, I think Ignacio is going to be able to really give, in terms of our podcast, we really haven't had a member of federal law enforcement be able to get with us to deep dive okay. the motorcycle groups, uh, the biker gangs, the one percenters, um, which we take a lot of pride in in our coverage of. Uh, we kind of stick to the to the Midwest and South. Uh, outlaws, pagans, uh, Mongols a little bit. And, uh, you know, this is this is going to be great because Ignacio uh, lived it. And then he's also written about it, wrote a great book yes. uh, about Taco Bowman, the former outlaws icon. So thank you for joining us, Ignacio. No, no thanks, uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> it's a great honor and privilege to be there and talk in front of you guys and your audience here. I've, uh, and I retired from ATF last year you know, with 26 years for law enforcement. And I never, ever thought I would have written 50 books after my retirement and been doing, I think, over 40 shows already and counting. Uh, the list keeps on growing and growing and some other cool things, maybe. I don't know if you can see that poster behind me or not. Yeah. But my autobiography, ATF Undercover, uh, it's probably my, my longest book I've written about my my career, my case and everything else. So I got something that works possibly. I'll, I'll be sure to let you guys know of a possible deal uh, to make it into a TV pilot that I've already finished the screenplay with a professional writer. So a lot of things going on. Not to say a lot of things going on. It's like exciting times. But uh, yeah, if you want me to give me a little background about myself or what do you want to do? Yeah, tell the audience uh, how you got into federal law enforcement and sure, uh, sure. you know your journey uh, up through the ranks and, and mm -hmm. being able to work on some of the big cases and then you know kind of maybe segue that into how you fell in love with writing and, and, yeah, and for sure. turn, you've been churning out this content at a uh, epic, epic rate. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's called uh, being retired and having some time to do it <laughs> for sure. So I mean, I was thinking maybe I should have called my books at ATF undercover, which is, you know, based on my, my life, the accidental agent, uh, because I had, had started, <clears throat> I, I was really going to go to uh, law school. And I, I was studying my master's. I had a, had a background. So my father, Ines Mills, had a background in political science and history. I had a degree up in Tampa. And I was studying at FIU, which is in South Florida, Florida International University, Miami International Relations. And I was going to end up going, I applied to law school, was accepted, actually up in Michigan, in, in Thomas Cooley, right? Very cold, yeah. very different. <laughs> and this is, we're talking about mid-90s. And uh, I, so I said, well, you know, law school is expensive. Uh, I would have to pay for myself, get some loans, right? And they had openings with customs. And I'm a very athletic guy. I was always good at shooting. Uh, I had a scholarship with tennis. I was a good runner in sports. So the academy wouldn't give me a hard time. I was thinking, I said, you know, I can do this. I'm athletic and all that. And I need Spanish speakers. Because in Miami, 90% of the flights coming from Latin America, they need custom officials to be able to talk to the people coming in, right? That's the best way to catch the, the, the guys who are smuggling. If you can't communicate with the people, then it's going to be hard to catch them. And I understood, obviously, my background, the different cultures, because obviously it's not just, you say, Latin America, but each one has their own unique culture. Obviously, you know, Colombians are different, Venezuelans and Mexicans, Cubans, Puerto Ricans, uh, et cetera. So I had a good understanding, obviously, being myself, 
my my family being uh, my grandparents Spanish came to Cuba, and then because of the Castro and the Revolution came to Miami. Very fortunate. And I was you know born in Los Angeles, and I was raised in uh, in South Florida. Uh, so I got picked up. I applied for customs, and um, I was there in Miami. In Miami at the time, give your uh, audience background. The, the uh, Cali and Medellin cartels were flourishing still in the '90s, right? So a lot of the drugs were still coming in through Florida, through the Caribbean, and coming on hard. And um, after about six months, I joined one of the elite teams at the airport there, the contraband enforcement team. And we would make some of the biggest seizures in the country at the time. So it wasn't uncommon to, to get a load of 800 pounds of cocaine coming in in this big fish, like grouper or what have you. So you got the block of ice next to the, the block of kilo. So it's, that was not uncommon. Or in the stems of the flowers, they would put all the, all the cocaine in there also. And that's hard to detect. Unless you have good intelligence, that, that is hard to pick up because the, the x-rays don't pick it up. And sometimes the, the dogs won't hit on that either. So the Colombians really takes our time in creating and smuggling. Of course, that will all change w- with the rise of the Mexican cartels and everything we push through the border. And that would be a big different push there. So, um, and I also did some other weird seizures too, um, like with guys who are, who are swallowing like pe- like pellets. Um, Jimmy? Yeah. Uh, can, yeah. It will be swallowing like huge pellets and stuff like that full of cocaine or heroin, right? And, and, and that's, you know, those guys will have like two or three pounds in their stomach coming in from Colombia. And these people will be used like peasants and stuff coming in from from there to be brought over here. And if you can't pass that stuff, let's say we didn't catch you, but you made it and you can't pass it. These guys in the cartels, you're in a cheesy. They're not going to wait for you three or four days to pass it. They're going to put a bullet in your head, gut you and take their product. Right. So, I mean, those are the kind of things. And you know, I'm in my what, early 20s. So I'm, <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of stuff and you're, and you're learning quickly how how prolific how much cocaine was coming in heroin into our country was unbelievable in the 80s was crazy but 90s was also pretty pretty crazy also um so working with customs i was saying scott i met a lot of people right because you're making so many seizures you know not just drugs you're seizing guns if it's going outbound you're seeing a counterfeit currency you're seizing a lot of things and i met a lot of people from either fbi who are coming in for seizures dea atf uh, you name it. And I said, you know, this is cool what I'm doing, but I want to take a different level because at the border, you have the border authority, right? You just, anybody comes in, you can seize and search it. But as an agent, you have to develop probable cause. You got to make your investigation and you take it to a different level. I wanted to do that. I wanted to be a, a, an investigator. Uh, unfortunately, customs at the time, they didn't want to hire their inspectors, their officials to become agents because they didn't want to lose the manpower on the border. Even though we had rest authority and everything else, and we had more experience of people, they didn't want to do it. So I was forced to put in for like other agencies like FBI, ATF, and DEA, and ATF was the fastest, which worked out which worked out pretty well because then I ended up working in uh, – I got picked up to go to Tampa. At least I didn't have to go to like, let's say, Southwest border. I didn't have to go to Alaska. I didn't have to go to some crazy city, which worked out because I needed Tampa because I went to college up in that area. Uh, and that's where it started. And, and I started in a group where the guys worked a lot undercover. And you see is something where you just can't jump into it, right? You have to study it. You have to have a mentor. You, know, you get yourself hurt. People are trying to say, I can do it. I can jump trade, into there's, it. There's trade craft. There's trade craft. You, 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 have yeah. to, you have to watch people because if you don't, you're going to get hurt. And, and there's no way this guy's thinking they can do it. And they make silly mistakes. And that's how you end up getting yourself shot, killed, or, or what have you. Uh, and I had guys who were really good. And I was able to learn from them. What, and, of course, I didn't look like this. I told you I didn't sound like this. You probably see some of my pictures online and stuff. And I had really long hair. I, I grew a big beard. Uh, <clears throat> I spoke Spanish. My English was broken. I spoke with an accent. Because in Florida, you don't want the guys to think you're educated, of course. You you want to think, you, you know, you came from Cuba. And I've been in the country for about 10 years, right? And this is what I'm doing. You know, last thing you want them to think is, hey, this guy <clears throat> is probably smarter than me or anything like that. So I dealt with a lot of people. And I dealt with repeat violent offenders gang members, armed drug dealers, international traffickers, domestic traffickers, uh, armed home invaders, uh, murder for hire cases. I mean, you you name it. And I was able to do and work those kind of cases. And because ATF is like smaller than FBI or, or DEA or, or some other big ones, like HSI, we got to wear many hats. So I was also the case agent on top of the undercover. I did my own property and I did my own workups. So let to say my days were busy. So I, I wear one hat. I finished doing the, the UC. Let's say the, by the dope and the guns. I come back to the office. And I'm just just doing the reports. 
you know, some guys, you know, they're in a cover, they get to travel and you just, here, here's my recordings. Here's the case agent guy. Hey, go, go, go make the transcripts or whatever. Now I have to do my, my own transcripts. If I'm get pen tolls, I'm going I'm to get pen registers. I'm going up on this. I'm going to have to do an affidavit for a, a search warrant. I did it all. So maybe that's why I translate so well in my writing because I self publish. I do all else. <laughs> I do all my own editing. I do my own book covers. I, I do everything You're else. You're reaping so. all the benefits from. Yes. Uh, it translate nicely. Be, being yeah. able to multi. You get, if you want to be successful with ATF, I mean, our agency is different. You have to be able to be a good multitasker and you have to be organized. If you're not, you're not going to make the big cases you want to do because it's uh, it's small. And on top of that, then you can help other people with their cases, right? So you just finish a big day doing that. Hey, so and so say I got surveillance. We're going to see if we can find this guy over here. So your, your days can be extremely long, and that, that's typical. Well, I was I put talking that in my about book. it twofold. You obviously benefited from your career, but I was talking about in your authoring. I mean, coming from people like Jimmy and I, who really have to sell a lot of books to see a nice royalty if you do it all yourself and you eliminate the middleman and get rid of the the book publishing company you're reaping all of the rewards you know you're I taking did. 80 percent of the profits i did i am that's why i did it that's right. that's one of the reason that, that's part of it about uh, and that's something people can look into i had a family member we'll, we'll get off topic here a little bit but i had a family member she was in publishing for for many many years and they told me the advantages first the backlog you can say about this is enormous, especially during COVID. It, it would say, we say, no, we're, we're waiting. Or they want you to pay to help publish it, right? You know, they want you to pay out of pocket to help publish these books. And I think self publishing with Amazon, with Kindle worked out well because I pay nothing. And you're right, I keep almost 80% of it, which, which is not bad. But that's not the reason why I did it. I, I did it because I, I really enjoyed it. But if you are thinking about it, anybody's out there writing, uh, that's great advice, I think, is to look into self publishing, and especially if you're motivated and you want your own book. Because a lot of these publishers are looking to make a profit. And if they feel like they can't make the money they're looking for, but if you want to write as a passion, I think that's something I think it's it's maybe an avenue to look into. Were you, were you uh, when you got to Tampa and you got into undercover work, well, at what point do the do the outlaws uh, motorcycle club get become on your radar? I mean, they, they were always there. I mean, obviously... I, I knew guys who had done the cases with the uh, the warlocks, right? That that was a big rivalry between the outlaws and the warlocks. There's been documentaries written about it. Uh, of course, the famous case here that Taco Bell would end up being indicted. Part of the indictment was with Bear Chafin, right? Mm -hmm. Where he he he's a former outlaw that becomes a president of the Edgewood chapter for the warlocks, and he is living with this guy, and he gives the orders to have a probate from Fort Lauderdale go kill him while he brings a chapter president to his house and he gives him a 22 caliber pistol right and they put a silencer on it and then he's in the garage and he puts two bullets in this guy's head so out there so that that, that was that was a big thing we, which we were seeing about uh but then you know atf took down some of the warlocks there and and what i've studied and read because i was something before my time was taco bowman he, he seemed like he was different than you know the sunny barger doc cavassos i mean these guys came from you know broken homes abusive alcohol or, or mambo shore he's, he's another perfect example from canada there uh very abusive home alcoholic uh they were in drugs and everything else but you know taco bowman uh he he, he was product of a catholic school education what what i was reading and, and and studying so you know i went to catholic schools also and and it's kind of rare to see someone turn out to be one of the most infamous brutal ruthless one percenters in biker history right so yeah i mean that, that, it, yeah Let's just give the audience just a quick primer. You know, Taco Bowman, uh, Harry Taco Bowman was yeah. outside of Sonny Barger, uh, who was was the kind of the OG Hell's Angel uh, until he died yeah. in this past couple months. Um, yes. Outside of Sonny Barger, Taco Bowman was the most infamous, most notorious, most ruthless, iconic biker boss of the last 50 years. Uh, yeah, came from... The Detroit area, uh, and and really took the Outlaws Motorcycle Club brand and expanded it. Took it international. Yeah. Uh, really emphasized, uh, um, you know, the, the bottom line is is the club, the club, the club, uh, and and what's best for the club 
flying that flag. And, yeah. you know, he took the outlaws to a whole different level to the point where they were on par uh, with the Hells Angels. They controlled, you know, virtually the entire Midwest yeah. uh, section of the country as the case was, was built out of, out of Tampa um, and came yeah, down. I, I knew, I knew the prosecutor. I worked cases in 97, with him. Came down in 97. Yeah. 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 He, yeah. It, it was two prosecutors. One of the guys I worked a lot with afterwards in a lot of these cases. And I remember you should talk to him about it. And uh, yeah, he, he, he's end up, uh, he was a fugitive before they did the case on him for, for almost two a year. Years. He was on the run for two years. Yeah. Uh, he was picked up in, I guess, I guess what I was reading in his house, the family's home in Michigan. Yeah. Well, so he's been hit. He was one of my neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> he lived right by where, where uh, he got, uh, where he got caught. He was being hidden by not just the outlaws around the country, but by the mafia, you know, uh, in, in Detroit, yes. in yes. Chicago, yes. they were helping move him around. Uh, I've done a, quite a bit of research on taco. Um, I've talked to dozens of, of lieutenants and friends and associates. Uh, I got to, you could <laughs> hit the siren, Ben. Uh, I got to uh, talk to him very briefly on the phone uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, just, you talked to Taco? Just, I, I was, one of my sources, it's, it's not a secret uh, because there's, it's been documented, but one of my uh, uh, big sources was a guy named Frank the Bomb Bomberito. Uh, who was the Detroit Mafia's longtime uh, liaison uh, to the biker world. Uh, he was very close to Taco Bowman and uh, would speak to Taco uh, on the phone. Uh, when I hooked up with the bomb, it was, you know, 10, uh, 10 plus years after Taco got lo uh, locked up. And uh, the bomb and the Taco would talk on the phone. One time I was at the social club and uh, I got to pay my respects. You know, it was like, you know, two minutes. I didn't wasn't a lengthy conversation. And then I, I actually was the, the reporter that broke the news of his death. Um, oh. Yeah, he did, but, he did uh, cancer, right? Yeah. Yeah. He had, throat, he had health yeah, issues, he cancer throat, issues. Throat cancer. But yeah. uh, you referenced the Bear Chafin murder, and um, mm -hmm. that was one of the uh, homicides that was included in that 97, yep. sprawling 97 um, indictment. Right. That was yep. actually followed up a couple of years later, I think in 2000, 2001, his predecessor, Big Frank Wheeler, um, was brought down. So in the same re, uh, in the same um, Rico area, well, but Rico, but in, in, in that out of that Tampa region. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. No, that they, they did a lot of big case there because they were big in Florida. And, and maybe that's something Eagles talked to what I was reading about. He had ambition that when and when 84, when he became national president. Uh, he wanted to make Florida an outlaw state. It was kind of an open state, and that was his ambition to go to Florida and uh, make it because obviously it's very lucrative with the drugs also, and uh, they would make a lot of money with the drugs, and, and they did. But um, a, lot, a lot of people think now there could be some issues in Florida now. Maybe we talk a little bit about, about the Mongols showing a little bit more presence now in Florida. They, they had an arrest recently, I would say about a few weeks ago, a few Mongols uh, killing uh, they think it, it was they thought it was an informant and uh, they that made big headlines in Pinellas County Sheriff's Office, uh, which is near Tampa in Florida. So I was surprised because when I remember, I remember where in case I never saw the Mongols ever in Florida. And I think you talk to you or somebody else, they think maybe there may be some sort of coalition working together with the pagans and Pagan. the Mongols to possibly go after the uh, the outlaws. So that could be interesting, something interesting to watch out for for an, an, a biker war out in Florida. Uh, between those three factions. That'll be interesting. I did see briefly in, uh, some pagans, but a lot of people were retired, right? So you're in Florida, they're supposed to be retired, right? So you see maybe some pagans here or there, but they're supposed to be retired. Um, a lot of outlaws, obviously, especially in the Tampa area. Uh, once once a few times, I saw a couple of Hell's Angels, but they were retired out there in cases. And, uh, you know, some of the cases I worked were a lot smaller than some of these massive racketeering cases uh, that were going out there. Uh, but like I said, I did a lot of guys who were violent and, and sometimes they, they had, they were violent with themselves, but some of the people we dealt with were violent against innocent people, you know, repeat violent offenders and stuff, gang members, uh, stuff like that. So, you know, I talk a lot that I just don't see the Italian mafia and the one percenters where they used to be. 
But wh- who I do see as a big threat to national security and a threat to our country are the street gangs and the cartels, right? That there, I see them becoming the big problem. That's where maybe Al Capone was back in you know, a hundred years ago, where the, the mafia ran Chicago, right? They had corruption, just like that. Is what the, you see the Sinaloa and CGNG are doing in, in Mexico with the corruption and taking over. And uh, because um, you know what I was reading, in the heyday Gambino family in the eighties was maybe making half a billion dollars a year, right? According to the Mexican government, just the Sinaloa cartel alone is making between uh, 12 to $15 billion a year. That's the Sinaloa. That's not talking about the other guys, CJNG, the Gulf Cartel, Seth. I mean, all these guys are raking huge amounts of money. And with that kind of money, you buy everybody. And if you don't buy them, you kill them. <laughs> and that's what these guys do best. And if you haven't seen those videos, see what these guys do to people who don't play ball with these guys. It, it, I'd it's, like it's to ask news. you something about that, if I may. Uh, I, I, wanna, yeah, sure. I definitely want to get back to the bikers, but since you brought up the cartel, yeah. Um, and, and maybe you're not comfortable um, uh, commenting on this, and if, if not, that's okay. But um, El Chapo recently made a statement that yeah. about U.S. Customs agents being on the take, and that that's a uh, a real issue that the cartels have a significant amount of U.S. Customs officials on the take. Um, yeah. what, what do you? What do you? How would you respond to his? Yeah, yeah, um, I wouldn't be surprised because it, it's on the border. And a lot of these guys who are out there uh, have families there and uh, they see what's happening. And uh, that, you know, every country is rolling to it. I mean, we just had recently uh, the president of Honduras, ex-president of Honduras, Hernandez, be extradited to the United States. I don't know if you guys saw that. Being a major, major, major trafficker of cocaine to the United States. Uh, and, and he was using the military to protect the loads that came from Venezuela, right? They're going to go to the United States. So. The corruption, I hate to say it, it is so enormous, uh, it, especially, you know, you see Mexico, you know, a lot of people think, uh, you know, I know we're talking a little bit here about this, but Lopez Obrador, you know, obviously he's a socialist, uh, but they think, uh, you know, he's too soft with cartel leadership, right? Hugs for thugs, they call it, the tactics going on there, and it's not working. These guys are getting emboldened, and the violence is still there. So his tactic, he doesn't want to do what Philip Colorado did, right? Go to war with these guys. Well, if you're not going to go to war, they're going to take over. And pretty much Mexico, a lot of people are saying it's a failed state already. It's it's gone to a point where uh, it's bad news. And that's why I always say I'm a big advocate that we need to finish the wall. We need to secure our country because it's just going to get worse. These guys are going to move up in here. So I, I I see them as a bigger threat. Yeah, the one percenters are a problem. They do this with among themselves. Yeah, they're they're bad. Uh, same with, uh, you know, the Cosa Nostra. I mean, it's not what it used to be. Either. I mean, obviously, they, they've been broken down the a dif- lot. The difference, the tr- Ignacio, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no. Finishing that, I'll make my point. Yeah, it, it, it's the uh, <clears throat> I think I think you just see the level of money. If you're involved in a drug game, I mean, look at gambling's being legalized, right? Your alcohol's been legalized, marijuana's getting legalized. A lot of this stuff is getting legalized. So the big boys like cocaine, heroin. If you're going to be dealing with that, you're either working directly or indirectly for these guys because they control the commodity. They control it all. Mexico now controls all the cocaine, heroin coming into our country. So. If you're going to do this kind of, you're going to be a drug dealer, you're working one way or another for these guys. So and, and in essence, the these guys are all working for the cartels. And, and that's where it's come because if you're going to sell product, well, it's going to be on their terms. And if things don't go right, they have teams that come in and handle things. And they're not afraid to send people uh, go in there and, and take care. And, and, they're, and they're brutal. You know, obviously, if you go in there, I don't know if you saw what happened to the Vogels a, a few months ago. They were in Juarez and uh, they got lit up, right? And uh, I think going with the Mexican articles I was reading, uh, it was a nine millimeter ca- the nine millimeter ammunition they were used. Now, were they wearing the colors? Was there something else involved in that thing? Possibly. But look at the different world you're looking at down south as opposed to here. And they don't care. These guys, they, there are no rules over there. There are no rules and, and they just do whatever they want. But can you, can you that's the world of the cartel. That? I know, Scott, you wanted to make a point. I'm sorry to, to jump in oh, and interrupt you. But can you talk about the, the Vago situation in Mexico? Um, I admit, I, I I didn't know about that. Um, you're talking about from a few yeah. years ago? The No, a few months ago. Oh, a few, because I, I know there was something with the Vagos in Mexico in 2019, but something just mm-hmm. recently. Oh, I'm yeah, embarrassed recently, to say I, it's, I, I didn't know it's about in that. One of my, it's in one of my books, the, the One Percenters, the Violent Biker Gangs. And you know, like, I research a lot. I read a lot, right? And, you know, I mean, I'm in retired, but I'm like you guys. I like to find information. And I was reading a, an article in Mexico about it. 
And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, it's unclear, obviously, you know, what triggered this, but they're on their bikes. Are uh, they wearing their colors? I'm not sure about that, but obviously they pissed somebody off and they got lit up. And, and that, and that was it. They, 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 they opened up on those guys and, and the three of them were executed. Done. Wow. So, and so we don't yeah. know, were they targeted by another a one percenter club or was, was this the cartel? No, no, the, 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 these are, no, these, these are not, no, no, these guys, what I was reading were uh, pissed at them for some reason. I don't know what happened in the bar and it got ugly and I guess they took it out on them. Uh, now is it drug related? A lot of it is sometimes drug related, right? You're, you're, and, you know, this is South of Juarez. That's a different world. That's a different world out there. And um, those are how things operate over there. Yeah, I mean, this is um, what um, we would talk about in political science as a non-governed space where um, yeah. really the, there is no like centralized authority that has that can intervene and and keep oh, no. keep order or something like that. So it's, no, it's really a Hobbesian nightmare. Uh, down there. Uh, remember, Juarez used to be, and I still think is one of the most violent cities per capita in the world. Because remember, uh, Chapo wanted to take over, right? He wanted to expand the Sinaloa and he went after the, uh, uh, in Juarez, the cartels over there. So it is blood, it is, it is brutal. It, it is a bad place. You know, I, I almost ended up, before I retired, I was going to want to work in Mexico, right? And uh, because ATF has agents out there also. You know, after po post, you know, Fast and Furious, you know, trying to also trace the weapons and all that. But uh, Lopez Obrador revoked our diplomatic immunity for agents, federal agents. So you don't have diplomatic community there and they don't want you being armed either. Hmm. You think I want to take my family in that situation and, and be kidnapped or whatever? The agents get killed. You know, we've had agents be murdered there also. So I said, you know what? I'm, I joined my time in headquarters at 26 years for law enforcement. I had my time. I decided to retire. <laughs> I think I did a good move, my, me and my family, for sure. But that, that's really intriguing. Uh, Scott, did you know about that recent development with the... Yeah, I, I, yeah I, I heard about it. I, did, I didn't know um, a ton of the specifics, yeah. but I mean, I think that exemplifies some of the, the point that we're making that, and we've talked about this on, on previous podcasts, and I think we've emphasized it to our audience that, you know, the level of violence, the level of power, the reach, the the just all all out ruthless approach. Uh, life is sure. cheap. Uh, sure. That the cartels are on a whole other planet, sure. in a whole other galaxy than any organized crime groups that are you know domestic. Yeah, in, in so. nature, I don't think that's a question. But the the one thing I wanted to to unpack a little bit and differentiate, but again, I think that that the Vagos situation uh, shows us that you could be the baddest biker club in the world, mm -hmm. and you go over across the border uh, to Mexico and and get into the crosshairs of the cartel. <laughs> they'll kill that you you're they'll burn your clubhouse Everybody. down they'll come after your mom and your dad um yeah. but I, I'm, I think people need to know that people need to yeah. understand that yes the point i that i want to make though in terms of the cosa no a traditional cosa nostra and the biker clubs at least right at this moment let's say in the last five years or mm. less even 10 years the mafia really isn't killing anybody anymore. No, I haven't seen much. Uh, the the biker clubs are still killing people, and the violence is is a is a regular thing. The Italians have, uh, by design, cut back on violence, cut back on uh, even the idea that murder you know is is last resort. Sometimes there, there's no resort. Uh, when it comes to homicide, they, the, the, the whatever organized crime group will just cut you off. Yeah. Um, but when we're talking about the pagans right now, the Mongols, the outlaws, uh, Hells Angels, Vagos, Banditos, pe people are still popping up dead. I mean, when it comes to what the pagans are doing 
right now, which is their overlord, uh, Conan the Barbarian Richter, who we've talked about on this podcast before, really, and I don't know, I don't know if this is true or not, but it it appears that he studied what Taco Bowman did 40 years ago with the outlaws and is trying to implement that same type of expansion blueprint with the pagans and it's causing violence across the country there's been you know uh, i i want to say at least four or five murders tied to this uh expansion in terms of uh um feuding and, and shooting between pagans and outlaws and hell's angel affiliates uh in, in this expansion the last five years so I, I don't think, I think it's, and then I'm going to throw it over to you and get your take on this. I think it's easier for the federal government to, at this point, tell, you know, the, the, the people that are worried about the Italian organized crime, who, who are they really hurting right now? I mean, as opposed to the, the, the pagans and the, and the pagans specifically, uh, that that are are leaving bodies uh, in multiple different states. Yeah, no, that's, that's that's a little bit more problematic for those guys. But you know what? They get violent. They get stupid. Well, that's when you you, you bring in those big racketeering cases, and that's when they systematically the bigger they get. You know, they say the harder they fall. That's what I think Taco Bowman's downfall was. He, they got too violent, and, and he and he hired and killed too many people, and then led big cases. So, I mean, I don't even remember back in two thousand two. And during the bike wars, the turf wars, right? It was at the Hellraiser um, Expo where the yeah. pagans tried to kill Sonny Barger and the Hell's Angels, yeah. and a big yeah. fight broke out there. And Hell's Angels had to kill a pagan. Out of that, out of that whole ruckus and melee, uh, a few months later, seventy some pagans were indicted. Right. So, the bigger and dumber they get, the bigger the cases are going to have. So, yeah, violence—that's a quick way, in my experience. You get you start getting the violence, like say right now with the with the Mongols in, in Pinellas County, they kill this guy because they thought he was an allegedly he was an informant, right? They thought he was a snitch, right? And uh, there's two guys there. Well, you get the order to kill these guys, right? Are they going to start putting this together? Like Taco Bowman was famous for giving a lot of these big orders to kill a lot of people, so are they going to start piecing it together? Also, I mean, the, and the Mongols themselves have had a history of uh, you know being infiltrated, right? I mean, back in, I don't know how much you know about Operation Black Rain uh, back in 2008, a three-year investigation. I mean, audience there. It, it wasn't just one guy. You know, Billy Queen did it back in the 90s. I don't see Under and, under and Alone. Uh, that was a great book. Great book, by that. the way. Great book. Yes. Yes, I read that one, too. So it's Jay Dobbins' book. I throw that one out there, too. Yeah, I read that one. No Angel, too. Um, and 2000, what was it? And so it's, so with three years, not only one, not two, not three, four ATF agents made patch members, right? And they needed girlfriends. So they brought in four ATF female agents to act as their girlfriends. So it had eight people inside the organization. Uh, I mean, it, it happens here and there. The Warlock case, they had a lot of infiltration because of what was going on. But it, it is unbelievable how many people that got in there. And, and of course, if people don't know why did this happen, Gadaka Voss has got greedy, right? He, he, he was a Sureño, right? He was yeah, Doc was, so for people that don't know, Doc was the uh, international or national president of the Mongols. I think international at the time. Uh, and he was a like an eye doctor, which is how he got the nickname Doc. Radiologist. Uh, he was a radiologist. Yeah, radiologist. And yes. uh, <laughs> it, 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 at an, uncer- an unceremonious end to, to his reign. You can say that again. You can say yeah. that. And, and the problem what he had, he got greedy. And he pissed off the establishment within the Mongols. He 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 did not. What I was reading, what I saw, he didn't respect. He thought they were a bunch of drunken old guys, and he came from the culture of the Sureños, right? The the Avenue guys who were a, a pretty much ruthless street gang. You know, he was raised in, and he wanted those guys. He he brought guys in who never even rode bikes before. But right. he owned Harley's. He had pickup trucks, right? And, and this is what he's bringing in there. And uh, the, the guys was it was bad news. And that's the quickest way to piss off. You know who he pissed off? You probably know this, the big war with La Eme, the Mexican Mafia, yeah. because the, 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 the guys from the avenues, they work for them and they have to get paid taxes. And so you're taking our guys to go to your organization uh, and then you're going to work for us. You're going to pay taxes. And uh, what I was reading, Cavazos didn't agree with that. 
And he said, no, I'm not paying you guys anything. And that pretty much started a war, which you're not going to win with the Mexican mafia. These guys are better, stronger. And the Mongols, the way they were, they, they did not do well. They, they, they got involved in shootings. They were killed. It, it was so bad that uh, they ended up booting him out. And they say, hey, we don't want this war. We want you out. And plus, they thought he was stealing, too. So there was a big combination of Doc Cavazos getting you know, booted out of the organization. Three months later, in that same year, Operation Black Rain comes to an end and ends up being 60-some Mon- Mongols end up getting indicted. Over 100-some search warrants throughout the country. Uh, lots of seizures from bicycles to currency to drugs to firearms. It, it, was, it was a big thing back then. And it led for the federal government to start this initiative to try to seize their patch, which, which is unprecedented, right? They went after the Mongols' patch. You seize the Mongols' patch, and it's in the court system as we speak. It's, it's back in. The judge, unfortunately, the jury agreed with it, but the original judge back then said that, he said, why does the government pick and choose? This was his what he said. Why does the government pick and choose which organized crime, which uh, group they want to go after, and which symbols, and others they don't? Because I think that the uh, Teamsters Union, they chose not to in the same district, and but yet they're choosing now to go after the Mongols. So he said, no. they're, going after, they're going after the copyright. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can't wear it. And uh, if you are, they can seize it. Uh, so that's where it's at now. It's back and appeal back and forth. Uh, so that happens. Be careful, other biker groups. They By take the, the way, Mongols, they may go after everybody else's. Uh, sorry to uh, interrupt, but Scott, no, no. as a you're a you're a lawyer, not a practicing lawyer, but you have a law degree. Is the Fed can the Feds make that case? It seems to me like I, I'm not convinced that they're gonna that they're gonna win that. It's in the appeal. I mean, it, it's already been through a couple decisions. Mm-hmm. I think it's in the it, it's at the appeals court now. Yes. Um, it's not looking good. <laughs> you know, if if I'm on the side of the Mongols here, and and then I also want to. Uh, get Ignacio's take on the soap opera that is kind of in real time yeah. uh, playing out within the battle for the copyright. And, and there's actually some potential appeal grounds uh, because of this soap opera. So you have uh, the former Long time, I mean, I think he, he was president for over a decade, uh, a president of the Mongols, a little Dave Santillan, um, Tatian, yeah. Tatian, and uh, he was the president when this trial was going on back in, yes. in 2018, yes. and he was advising <laughs> the attorneys on who they should and should not call to the stand. Well, now it's come out uh, almost four years later, yeah. allegedly, allegedly, that yeah. one of the witnesses that the attorneys were desperate to call was a former ATF agent uh, who, if you if you listen to the, a tape that was made of, of little Dave yeah. drunk talking to his girlfriend or his wife, uh, he says that he has been working with the ATF and giving information and that this yeah. and this, this ATF agent was about to retire and that he only mm-hmm. had the amount of time until this agent retired uh, mm-hmm. to kind of figure out what his next move was. The, the, the wife brings the, that tape to Mongols leadership. Little Dave is ousted but, from the group. Yep. Um, he's still kind of making a case out in the press that this all that. videotape was taken out of context um, mm-hmm. and that he was never uh, an informant. But what's interesting is these the, the appeal grounds right now, some of them are based on the fact that little Dave was telling the attorney that he couldn't call witnesses that these attorneys are saying we should have been al- allowed to call. And oh, by the way, he's admitting that he was working with them the whole time. Yeah, no, no, there's there's a lot of issues issues there. Yeah, she she. I guess they were having a fallout. He seemed like he had a few drinks. Uh, if your audience wants to look at the video, it, it's out there. You just put in David Santi and calling his wife. And uh, she has him, I guess she thinks that he's cheating on her or whatever. So she's upset with him. So she records it. And, and, and puts him on the speakerphone, right? 
And some of the stuff that he's saying is, uh, you know, it's unbelievable. He's saying it, that he needs an exit strategy, that the uh, the case agent, same one from you know, Operation Black Rain, from all the way back, you know, the mid 2000s to now he's retiring. And I, I need to find a way to uh, to get out of it. And uh, he said, you've been working with them. And, and he's kind of like saying, you know, obviously he has. Um, and, and I guess one of the judges, another judge, one of the court security officers, I guess, saw him meeting with him at Starbucks before they met. So there, there is that's been collaborating some of the stuff that's been going on there. So I guess that's part of the appeal is that, you know, was he giving strategy, defense strategy when he was the national president to guys who's being tried during 2018? But that, this is the second one, because Doc Cavazos was one of the first guys to plead guilty. Right. And you know, these racketeering cases, you get like, look what Taco Bowman got two life sentences, or you get, you get hammered. He got 14 years, 14 years. And the Bureau of Prisons, you look it up, he's not there anymore. Yep. So he's, so he he's, has, he's up. A lot of people believe that uh, the doc uh, was a cooperator, is a cooperator. Well, he, he said that, you know, you look at the court documents, he said that the Mongol nation, and it's unprecedented to say it was a criminal enterprise. And yep. the patch was used, and he's even helping seize the patch. So I, I would have, I mean, I don't have any firsthand knowledge because that was my case, but you just read what's out there. And you know, it's very rare to see a national president plead guilty like that. Normally, they're the ones that fight to the end, right? When, when, when do you see that? And especially, he's the first one to get on board. Not only that, he's the first one to sign all the plea agreements. 14 years. I, I, I it's, this is number two for the month. So you got the Mongol nation. Mm-hmm. It's interesting to note that, uh, Little Dave and his wife are back together now. Um, <laughs> and she's claiming that she knew that what she was giving to the club was out of context. So she's trying to protect him. And then the final thing I'll say about it is the agent took the stand recently at a, a motion hearing in the appeal uh, and claimed that Little Dave was never his informant. So it, right. it's, I, I mean, and, and again, be, being an informant is somebody who's documented, right? Yeah. You have informants and then you have people who are cooperators, right? Who, who gave you information here and there. So, you know, maybe it, he was, maybe he wasn't, but you wouldn't have said, I mean, he said that not being recorded that he needs an extra strategy plan and that he was, I would have to say that there was something going on there, but. Well, I, don't, I don't have any, there's no doubt in my mind. And, and frankly, I said this to Jimmy off air. And I get. I want to get your take on it. If I'm if I'm little Dave, I'm spending less time doing media interviews and uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, work my way back into the good graces of the club by claiming that I was misunderstood or taken out of context. I would get. I'd be running for the hills. I mean, I, I wouldn't be. It, it seems like it's very dangerous for him to be out in the open trying to massage I, I think, a yeah, situation sure. that there's no massaging to be done i think especially in that culture that exists and especially with these kind of guys that were brought in i i think you're absolutely right very dangerous situation he's in and his wife put him in that dangerous situation uh he did what he thought was best for himself uh but uh, i think his situation is uh, very grave and you know they, they say you live and die by the sword right you know, these guys' lives end up only so many ways. And there's nothing glamorous about being in an organized crime. It's either you're going to be, you know, shot or killed by within or by a rival, or you're going to do some serious bedtime. And that's that's the way it's going to end. It's going to end one of those two ways for him. And the interesting part will be with the patch. Let's see what happens if the feds do end up getting be able to seize the patch, for the patch, and then that might trickle to other you know, one percent of groups open the floodgates. Oh, oh, oh yeah, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. They'll go after Hell's Angels next, and and um, I, I, awesome. I, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. But uh, Ignacio, I, I'm wondering what you think about um, from from my research. There are some outlaw biker club leaders, and maybe they're 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 losing ground right now. Who 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 would rather uh, take the the approach of the uh, Italian uh, Cosa Nostra groups? And and start to be less conspicuous. I, I I think there are some biker leaders out there who who would rather and even talking about so going so far as not wearing your colors or not wearing your your patch and and let's keep this more buttoned up and and let's make money and not make headlines. And it, it's kind of interesting because in a lot of ways that 
very much goes against the traditional ethos of what you think of outlaws, which are hellraisers, very much in your face, uh, you know, brawling ca- guys. Ca- counterculture, right? Counterculture movement. Precisely, right? That's so, what Sonny Barger represented. Yeah, so can you imagine that that's ironic that you have more of these like boardroom outlaw <laughs> uh, biker leaders? And uh, what do you, what do you, what's your take on that? Do you think any of that? I mean, that might be a smarter strategy, but I'm not sure how successful they'll be in convincing yeah. the rank and file to, to go that route. That, that's what they should be doing. If they're smart, they are. But since a lot of these guys, you know, maybe they have a drug problem. They have an addiction. It's sometimes common sense, not so common. I mean, you're pretty much put a bullseye. Hey, look at me. I'm organized crime. I'm a, a international. I'm a crime syndicate here. But you know what? Some of these guys, this is what they are. And, and this is where they're going to go down. And they say, you know what? You know, that they, they thumb then, you know, put the middle finger and say, I don't care. This is what we're going to be all about. So. I heard, I, I thought that, uh, didn't Taco Bowman sometimes will wear suits sometimes? Yeah, yeah. 100%. I was about yeah. To, yeah, I was about to throw that in there and say that, you know, Taco, a, a yeah. man ahead of his time, uh, knew how to finesse that situation and walk that that tightrope mm-hmm. where he was just as comfortable jumping in a, uh, you know, into a three-piece suit mm-hmm. and cutting cutting his hair and covering up his tattoos and shaving his beard and going to meet with other organized crime dignitaries, in some cases, politicians and and dirty uh, members of law enforcement, whatever, that he had to be mm. looking a different way. But then, you know, uh, a couple of weeks later, you'd see him and, you know, he's got his beard again and his hair is a little bit uh, grown out and he's showing all his tattoos and he's amongst the rank mm-hmm. and file and they're and they're, yeah. eating, and they're eating it up. You know, he was sure. he, he had a. Uh, this this mystique around him, and uh, you know, could really um, just mesmerize uh, his uh, the members of, of the outlaws that were around him. And I've just heard how uh, Taco uh, just knew how to weave through all of those the, the lanes of the of the underworld highway, and mm-hmm. and 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 people described him as a chameleon and and he could adapt to whatever situation uh you know made itself available he 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 molded to that situation to the people that he was interacting with yeah that's, that's being smart that, that's adjusting Did, didn't they uh, well I was reading the mafia had a hit on him and he yeah. had to go and talk to him and say hey, you have to work this out with these guys well frank, frank frank the bomb who we referenced earlier uh was able to to smooth over the situation. Um, that was a, a scenario. It happened in the late eighties, early nineties, yeah. where the mafia in Detroit and the outlaws were doing a lot of business together. And this was when Taco was really surging as a as a leader. He had been uh, international president at that point for five six years, and he was feeling himself. And I think. Uh, he overstepped. Um, he overstepped some boundaries with the Italians, and he muscled his way into some uh, backdoor casinos. And mm-hmm. frankly, Jackie Jackaloni, who's the reputed boss of the Detroit Mafia today, back then he was a either soon to be capo or young capo, uh, didn't really have the gravitas to step to someone like Taco at that point. So he went to his uncle, uh, Tony Giacalone, the guy that killed um, Jimmy Hoffa, who was the the street boss of the Detroit Mafia and said, we need to kill Taco. And Tony Jack just listened to his nephew and put the contract on Taco's life. Within the the next weeks, uh, months, as things were percolating, I think, some common sense was was spoken into Tony Giacalone's ear by people that said, listen, this is more of a situation of your nephew um, biting off a little bit more than he can chew and, and giving Taco an inch and he took a mile. Uh, it wouldn't be wise to, to carry out this contract. Let's just yeah. uh, make nice. And, and Frank the Bomb was able to to help smooth that over because he was the right-hand man of Billy Jackaloni, Jackie's dad and Tony Jack's brother. So, um, yes. That was a nasty. 
That, that would yeah. be a nasty war for sure. That, well, we, that, we, the outlaws and the mafia would be nasty. That I don't think at that point in time the Detroit Mafia would have won. I think the bikers would have won. No, I think so too. You're right. I I I, I think they they were they were strong then, and the mafia it was was getting a little weaker what they used to be, and uh, it, it would have been ugly. And uh, you know a lot of these guys, uh, you know, especially if they kill Taco, it's so popular. That that would have been ugly situation, ugly, ugly, ugly. Now, I was going to ask you about where do you think the outlaws are today? Because I was, I was doing some research, and I think I saw one of your articles that you wrote in the Buffalo News about who, who's running the outlaws Tommy today. O. Tommy O. Yeah. Wait, hold on, Jimmy. Before we jump, yeah. you got Jimmy got some uh, something to say. Yeah. On? Yeah. Thank you. I was just going to say, uh, you know, we've talked to some guys with the Italians off the record and about that specific situation. And, uh, you know, I agree with Scott and, and we're, we're, I'm talking about someone who was directly involved with that situation. And they, and they said, yeah, first of all, they, they thought, if anything, that that leadership in terms of the Jack Maloney's were were probably in the wrong on that on that dispute with with Taco Bowman. And that also that it wouldn't be smart to go to war with the bikers because of the, the numbers game. And also the third part back to, you know, Scott talking about how charismatic Taco Bowman was. That there were a lot of Italian mafia guys who liked Taco and made money with him and felt like this is this is a bad decision from about you know fifty different angles <laughs> to try to put a. He contract. lived in the he lived in the same neighborhood with those guys. He right, lived in those right. point. Right. Yeah. So uh, most of the rank and file mafia guys liked him, and so right. that was a very short sighted um, decision by the Jackalones too, because even within their own organization, there was no support for that. For going for going through with something like that for a lot of different reasons. So well, that that goes back and history repeats itself. You know, Doc Cavazos made a very unpopular decision to try to go after uh, M.A. the Mexican Mafia, where you're outgunned, you're going to lose. I think the Mafia realized that this is a battle you don't want. You don't want to fight with these guys, and if you don't, then you know they, they get out. But uh, yeah, I, I saw the name of that this uh, strip club called Farrells come up right yeah. up in state New York. Yeah. And it's a, a strip club that's controlled by the Italian mafia in Buffalo, the Chidaro crime family. Chidaro, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. His uh, his nephew, uh, Big Joe Chidaro, that we should say has never been convicted of any federal crimes, uh, is an alleged organized crime figure, um, although he was booted out of the union about 25 years ago for organized mm -hmm. crime ties, but has never been convicted in court. Um, but he is, according to the federal government. He's the boss of the Buffalo Mafia. Uh, his dad was the boss before him. And uh, his nephew owns the premier strip club uh, in, in Western New York called Pharaoh's. And the head of security at Pharaoh's for the last 10, 15 years has been John Ermine, uh, who they all call Tommy O., who, according to some court filings in the last uh, 18 months, is the new international president of the outlaws. So you see yeah. this, what's old is new again, uh, <laughs> this alliance uh, between the mafia and the outlaws seemed, uh, seems to be uh, alive and well uh, in New York right now. I mean, I'll throw it back to you. I mean, what I find interesting from someone who studies the outlaws, the outlaws the, the seat of power in the outlaws has always been Chicago, Detroit, or down in Florida. It's never been not in Buffalo. New York. It's never not been Buffalo. in Buffalo. It looks like it's now. Yeah. <laughs> Everything looks now. Yeah, because when, when it was Chicago, he moved to Taco Bowl and moved it to Detroit. So right. he and because he's from he's a mission guy. So and right. I guess and this guy's a buff. So I guess it makes sense. These guys want to keep it where they're from, keep it local. You know, so that 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 makes sense. And what I was reading, probably reading the same court documents and everything else, that, that there's quite a few outlaws that work for Ferrells, right? They had like eight yeah. or ten outlaws that work in, at Ferrells. So, yeah, that that seems like it's uh, and, and and it seems like he's taking a page from Taco, where he wants to expand in the Northeast, right? It, it going, seems like he wants to take in, over. Going hard in New England. The, yeah, the I saw that. Outlaws in the last two years have responded to what the pagans are doing. It's this, it's this chess match that's going on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Pagans announced this expansion effort, or at least they announced it internally. No, they didn't put out a press release, but they announced <laughs> it in uh, the end of 2017, 18. 
And then around 1920, uh, Tommy O and the Outlaws respond. They don't go as uh, wide as the Pagans. The Pagans are going like as far west as uh, Washington State and Oregon, which is thousands of miles you know, uh, away from where there had ever been pagan activity. Yeah, that's uh, as far. But uh, Tommy O has decided to to focus his outlaws expansion on New England. So yeah, a mm-hmm. lot of uh, parts of Massachusetts, Vermont, um, Rhode Island, New Hampshire. And, and he's going to have his, his plate full trying to keep Florida. It, it yes. seems like it's it's going to be on now for Florida. Everything you're looking at, I've never seen Mongols like that in Florida. So that 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 is something that's you, is going to catch our attention. So that I I do see a battle. Uh, if you, you're going to say where you see a nice battle going on, I think the battle for Florida, unless Hurricane Ian took care of all the clubhouses. <laughs> well, There's so quite I'm, a few. Uh, just kind of into I want to uh, as we as we wrap up here, I want to double back to something you said earlier in our conversation about how you know sometimes incidents that don't immediately result in indictment will spur activity that shortly thereafter creates yeah. said, said indictment. So yes. with the pagans, you have Keith Richter, Conan the Barbarian, um, the president, who, who, by the way, is not like uh, I mean, he, he's ambitious like Taco Bowman, but from my research and people I've spoken to, uh, Conan the Barbarian is kind of a, uh, what you see is what you get. And he looks like a biker kind of out of central casting. He looks like, <laughs> they call him Conan the Barbarian because he's chiseled and he's got long hair like Arnold Schwarzenegger did in Conan oh, the really Barbarian. Gotcha. And right. uh he d- he doesn't seem like someone that wants to cut his hair and and cover up his tattoos and uh, and wear wear a three piece suit. He wants to to wear his rocker. Uh, wow. yeah. And he was arrested on a a parole violation, leaving mm-hmm. a party uh, a couple years ago, and now is finishing up. I feel like I think for the last year of a two year prison sentence, possibly two and a half years, he'll be out by the end of 23. Um, you know, putting my, uh, you know, my, my prediction hat on. Sure. I, and based on what you said about the way that these things kind of, uh, the order of operation on some of these things, I I don't think Conan is just going to walk out of prison and all of a sudden, you know, uh, the clock starts running again. I think the clock's been running and they're probably building some type of racketeering case that they'll then drop at in his lap shortly after he gets out of prison and he'll have a whole new set of legal headaches. Yeah, of of course. I mean, he's probably still been running the pagans, right? You know, like Uh, some of these guys. Officially, he's he's passed it off to um, a guy, uh, Big Bob, uh, who was a, kind of an elder statesman uh, yeah. out of Virginia, but not the he's not someone that's looked at as a long term. It's looked at by people as Conan has someone in there keeping the seat warm, and when Conan gets out, he's going to slip right back into. Yeah, and, and like a lot of times they say, you know, maybe Sonny Barger, he was locked up in the 80s, right? Uh, you know, some say that he still ran the show, right? Because it, you have to go through them. Uh, on paper, you have somebody, but then the real decision to kill somebody or not still has to go through certain people. Um, you know, you look at the indictment of Taco Bowman, it, it goes 80s and 90s, right? Big case. So everything he's done already, it's just being put together. People are going to cooperate. They're going to they're say this happened here. This happens, and then all of a sudden, they put it together, and here we go, and the next guy goes down. So the, the pagans are violent. They're doing problems. They're going to start taking down their leadership. They're well, and, let's look how we got, and let's look how he got violated. So he's at a party. He leaves the party. On his way back home, he's pulled over. I mean, do the math. Yeah. Uh, someone at that party or someone 
in that car with Conan tipped off the police who then pulled him over and, and catch him with a gun. So there's someone in, in his inner circle that's already cooperating. Yeah. Yeah. No, that you see that a lot with these guys. It, it just, I mean, uh, uh, the hell's angels had the same situation happen. Sonny Barger did time because, you know, you probably know that, you know, they say Sonny Barger in the, uh, in the seventies and sixties, he cooperated with law enforcement, right? With the Oakland police department. That's right. one of the reasons why he didn't convict of his murder. The sergeant testified on his behalf that he was helping giving guns and, and explosives to guys who were of a Black Panther Party or the underground weather, you know, leftist terrorist organizations type things. Mm -hmm. And he cooperated. Well, somebody did him. Uh, Tate, I guess, he wrote a book about it. And uh, he was informant, I guess, against the Hells Angels that these guys wanted to get payback against the outlaws, you know, for killing, uh, you know, one, one of their guys outside a bar, right, in Louisville. So and they were ca crossing state lines. And he and he was, you know, I guess the, the president of the Anchorage chapter was killed. And he was a sergeant of arms and, and he ends up, you know, working against, and that, I think that kind of hits Sonny Barger, the irony of all ironies. He was a cooperative and from now they turn on him. <laughs> so it happens with the Mongols. It happens with the, I mean, the, the outlaws had it also. So I, I think it's, I wouldn't be surprised. The same thing happened with the pagans. Well, with Taco Bowman, uh, his right-hand man, Joe Black, uh, mm -hmm. I think his name was Wayne Hicks, but he went by Joe Black, you know, Joe Black flipped, and that's yeah. one of the reasons Taco was brought down. So right, right. They all they all do when they're looking. They're, 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 they're saying they're, they're guys that do, end up doing a lot of time. They say they wish they would cooperate because you're going to do a lot of your percentage. It's not going to be you got early. You're going to end up doing ninety five percent of the time you're going to do it. So if you want to get on board early, you cooperate and you take down, so you don't have to do that all the time. Because Taco Bowman, I think when I'm looking, probably did the most. Uh, any of these guys, Sonny Barger, uh, Mambushur, uh, Cavassos, uh, he, he did. So he was up, I think, 16, 17 years before, before he, he died. died, and he was dying. He was miserable. So, but he's a bad dude. So I don't feel bad for him. <laughs> that's for that's for sure. He he he, he, he had dude. some. He he did some. He he had some. Look at the indictment and some of the stuff he's he, he's done. Uh, he has shown no mercy to a lot of these guys who died well, bad deaths. Last thing I'll say, and then uh, Jimmy, jump in here with, with some uh, final uh, words. But I don't know if you know this, but I want to tell the audience how Taco Bowman ended up getting caught in, oh, okay. in 99 was the, the, I don't know if it was uh, federal or local law enforcement got their hands on a audio recording uh when taco was on the run mm. talking to his girlfriend and they leaked it to another girlfriend or a wife oh there you go and they knew that by telling one of taco's girls that he was still talking to this other girl when he was on the run would get the one girl that was upset get you know dropping a dime on him and that sure. and that's what that's what happened right and and they got him in uh near his family's house right yeah in sterling sterling heights uh michigan sterling heights yeah i saw that yeah i read the, i read about that right where, jimmy, right where jimmy grew up oh <laughs> yeah that's what i was saying yeah uh, my neighbor um yeah i'd like to ask you you know we talked about some of this um relationships between outlaw biker clubs and the and the mexican mafia outlaw biker mm. clubs and the italian mafia but uh, back to the outlaw bikers and the cartels, see what you think. Uh, we've had uh, Yoan Grillo on our show before, shameless self-promotion. You can check out our, our episode with him. He's a great reporter down in Mexico City. And he just okay. wrote a book about the uh, gun trade, the arms, uh, arms trafficking. And, mm -hmm. um, and I know this comes up in Scott's reporting too, not just Grillo's reporting, that some of the um, arms trafficking to the cartels, we know almost all those guns are coming from the United States. If it, I mean, some of them are internal through like corrupt police and military, but a lot of the, the guns are coming from the United States. Uh, in, in your investigations, did you, did you see any of this like um, nexus between outlaw clubs, trafficking weapons to the cartels? Did that come up in your investigation? No, well, with, with those guys. You know, a lot of those guys, they, they, need, their, they need the weapons. Um, the, what, what I saw, they, they, they wanted weapons for their own stuff, what they're doing. Um, you know, I read about some of the stuff, but not personally, but, you know, like I said, most of the guns, you know, we're, we're, we, Florida, especially Florida, 
F- Florida is, you know, gun source, not only internally, domestically, but internationally. So it, it, it's it's amazing because you, you can pretty much buy guns. I wrote books about this um, and, and some of the solutions we need, you know, with, uh, you know, international trafficking, uh, with domestic trafficking. Uh, you know, there are people who come in and they'll buy guns for other people, right? You know, let's say for the cartels, you know, you, you got this female, you got a guy who has no criminal history. They'll buy six, seven, you know, identical make models of a weapon. And, you know, those guns are going down, down range. Those kind of people need to have minimum mandatory time. <clears throat> if you don't do that, they get slapped on the wrist and they get nothing at all for that. And it keeps on being a cycle. That's just one of many things that has to be tightened up uh, for us to combat that. Because obviously the drugs coming in, if we, if we want to consume the drugs, right, we wouldn't have all this violence. So we also have to work on that side with addiction. We have a major problem with addiction in this country and in Europe and all over because that's what fuels the cartels. We don't have this addiction problem, then things are not where, where it is. So, so it's a very complicated issue, things that have to be worked on. You have to address it so many ways. But yeah, I mean, U.S. is a, uh, you know, one of the world's biggest manufacturer of weapons in the world. It makes And, and the, the Europeans that used to be, you know, the Glock and the SIGs and the H&Ks, they've come over here. So, you know, Glock is made in Georgia, you know, Six Hour and the Northeast. All these great European companies know it because most of the guns are consumed here, purchased here. You know, we, we love our guns. You know, it's, um, I'm a very, a lot of people don't know, ATF agents, the ones I know, are very pro Second Amendment. You know, there, there's a con- concept that we want to take people's guns. No, we want people to defend themselves, right? We're a frontier nation, independent country, right? Guns are important to protect yourselves uh, because, you know, I always say, don't I ever expect the police to come and save you if you got someone in your house. It'll take about 10 to 15 minutes. And and it's and if you never used a gun and you try to use it then, that'll be a bad time to learn. I, I assume everybody get the concealed weapons permit, do the training, do the practices. But it's it's not I don't see guns being an evil. I think they're they're helping is to what's what's going on with the addictions, the criminals, and what's between the ears with people with mass shootings. Because we also have a big problem with that also in this country. Uh, mental health issues that have to be dealt with. And these guys you see it over. And I wrote a book about that. Some of the worst mass shootings in the United States and how we can stop them. I get some solutions what we need to do also with mass shootings. So interesting stuff. You like what I'm saying. Let everyone know where they can find your stuff and and where they can consume your art. And uh, this has been, uh, this has been a a tremendous interview. Uh, You've done it all. You've said it all. I mean, really, this is, uh, this has been great. Yeah, I can go out for hours and hours. I mean, when you write about it a lot, it's hardwired. So you can talk a lot. As you know, it's it's fun to talk about. And I really enjoy this. Uh, Amazon. I'm, I'm exclusively on Amazon. You type in my name there. I think you see it, Ignacio Esteban. Uh, like I said, I've done 50 books and I've uh, done my autobiography, ATF Undercover. Organize. If you like our conversation here, I've done four books on the one percenters, the violent biker gangs, which gives you an over. If you don't really know much about it, I'll talk about the big six and I break down some of the big cases that are going on there. You know, you have the banditos. We haven't touched, you know, I've touched about the banditos. Then we touched a little bit about the Vagos, you know, the Mongols. Uh, you got the Hells Angels, the outlaws, the pagans. Those are the big six. Actually, other ones. I talked a little bit of Sums of Silence. That was a great case also back in the uh, in 2000s, what happened, ATF infiltrate. ATF pretty much agents have pretty much infiltrated every one of these crime syndicates, one way, one way or the other. So if you, I, you like some of that information, I put that in that, that book there. Uh, I, I've talked about Sonny Barger, uh, Full Throttle, uh, Riding with the Hells Angels, Life of Sonny Barger, which is good. Taco Bellman, infamous uh, outlaw biker, and Doc Valsis, The Fall of Mongol Nation. Uh, so if you like that, that's good. Italian mafia stuff, I've done that too. Uh, street gangs, I've talked, I've done, I did a lot of street gang cases, and that's where I see the biggest problem we have in our country: the culture that repeats itself, the violence that repeats itself. And if you don't get these kids out of that culture, this will not stop. It just keeps on getting bigger and worse. And that, that to me is one of the biggest problems we have in our country. What I'm seeing, and that you know, the prison gangs are getting bigger too. And I took, I took a pretty big, big about prison gangs, the Mexican mafia, and the control they have. They're inside, but they control all the street gangs, which is interesting. So if you like all this stuff, there's a lot of stuff out there. And if you don't like, if you like politics, there's politics too. And if you like travel books, I've done that too. <laughs> that is awesome. You are a, re- a true Renaissance man, like uh, Jimmy and, and myself. Uh, you know, that's where that's where we strive to be. You you've reached it. Uh, thank you so much for for joining you, us. Um, Jimmy, any final words? Yeah, I'll just say yeah, thank you again, Ignacio. And um, I look forward to, uh, I teach a course on gangs and organized crime in the winter semester. So uh, don't be surprised if you hear from me um, 
maybe we'll figure out a way for you to communicate with some of my students. So if you're oh, good. so kind, sure. so kind <laughs> to do that. And uh, we appreciate your time. And I'll just remind everyone uh, not only to check out Ignacio's books, but please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please follow us on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And uh, please spread the word about the Original Gangsters podcast. And uh, this was a great episode. Thanks, uh, Scott, for putting this together. And thanks, Ignacio, for spending time with us. No, thank you, guys. I appreciate it. And if you want to go down the world, do another one on, let's say, El Chapo or wherever else you guys want to go down the path, I'll be more happy. Street gangs are very interesting. I got to let you guys know also if my book ends up being picked up for a TV series. I was yes. going to say, we got, thank you. We got to have you on if that happens. And yes. uh, yep. I'll let you, you, know. you lived, you lived a, a television script. So, you know, it's yeah. only natural that we could uh, see a character based on you in a TV nice. show. I know Jimmy and I have, have waded in those waters and uh, it's, it's a, it's an experience. It's an education and everyone, you know, everyone's just got to, you know, pull for each other and any type of project, uh, like that, that gets off the ground and gets made is is good for everyone else that are trying to get projects like that, you know, made. So I know I, luck. I never thought I never thought I'll be doing this when I was last year in ATF headquarters. That's for sure. And, and yeah. within a year, it's been a heck of a ride. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, you guys. For Jimmy and and Benny behind the behind the glass, we will see you next week. Scott Bernstein, OG Podcast out.